Hello scholars, welcome back. Mr. Hinkle here and today we are going to introduce this rather deep, rather vast, rather extensive, all-encompassing, about 71% encompassing of our Earth topic, the oceans. The purpose of today's lecture is to, at first, analyze the distribution of Earth's water. There's a lot of water on Earth, and it's not all in the same place. So where is it? Spoiler! Mostly in the oceans. We will define and familiarize with our, uh, with the concept of what an ocean is, and then we will provide a general understanding for each of the world's five major oceans. We'll talk about what makes them all unique and incredibly amazing. So let's get into it. Earth's water is unequally distributed across the world. And in fact, these are esta approximations, right? They're not pinpoint accurate, but for the most part, approximately 97% of Earth's water is salt water in the oceans. And the other 3% is fresh water. Now, that 3% is not all available, so we've got 97% in oceans. About 2% is in glaciers and ice caps. So we'll just say it's frozen. A little bit less than 1% is available fresh water. And then we have a very tiny fraction. We'll just say uh, fraction is going to be in the atmosphere as water vapor. Now, I have a really cool, at least I think it is, I hope you do too, demonstration of the distribution of Earth's water as seen through cutting apart an apple into various pieces. Please go ahead and watch that video right now, check it out. Otherwise, let's keep going. So with this thought in mind that 97% of Earth's total water is located in Earth's oceans, maybe we should connect on what is an ocean? What the heck is an ocean? Inherently, we know what the ocean is intuitively, but an ocean is a large, continuous body of salt water covering a significant portion of Earth's surface. And all of the oceans on Earth connect. So there are no geopolitical boundaries to where one ocean stops and another begins because uh, oceans circulate globally through the process of thermohaline circulation, <clears throat> connecting surface currents with deep currents. That is in another lecture. But we have five recognized oceans, <coughs> pardon me, each with their own distinct characteristics. <clears throat> Let's talk about oceans a little bit. Oceans are cool. They're the dominant feature. When you look at Earth, it is called the blue planet because our planet is covered with water, of which 97% of the water on Earth is in the oceans. The oceans are the largest habitat supporting life on Earth, and it is the habitat where, to the best of our understanding, life began. Oceans themselves have a long history on Earth, forming about oh, roughly 3.8 to 4 billion years ago, because when Earth started, it was a big, hot, homogenous ball of material that then differentiated into its internal structure, core mantle crust, which went on to uh, cool on the outside, forming Earth's first continents. That led to hundreds of millions of years of rain that started to pool up and collect and develop Earth's first oceans, a really cool thing. From there, life is believed to have begun at hydrothermal vents, areas that are nutrient rich and have all of the right ingredients that could have been that spark for life to begin. But I digress because we're introducing our oceans and this is a little bit of oceanic history. 
So oceans cover 71% of the Earth, contrary to the other 29% of Earth's surface, which is covered by land. When you look at the globe, when you look at a map here, we can see two main features stick out. When I look at this map, I see water and land. I see oceans and land. More ocean, right? From that map up there, we've got more ocean than we do land. So we've got about 71% of Earth's surface are oceans, with the remaining 29% of Earth's surface being land. Great, so that means that there is more water covering the surface of the Earth than there is land. And oceans cover an enormous area, about 130 million square, no, no, what did I say, 139, yeah, let's not forget about that extra 9 million, 139 million square miles, that's 361 million square kilometers. That's the area of land. You think about how big your city is. Maybe it's about five square miles or five miles in one direction, five miles in another direction, 25 square miles. We're talking 139 million square miles. Whoa. And if we think about the volume of water the oceans contain, 332,519,000 cubic miles, or 1,386,000,000 cubic kilometers. These numbers are so big I can't even really put my head around it, but let's just say the oceans are big, so big, covering about three quarters of Earth's surface, or more exactly, 71%. The oceans are deep. In fact, the oceans are deeper than the land is high. What does that mean exactly? Well, the deepest location on Earth is called Challenger Deep, located in the Mariana Trench. And we'll learn about what a trench is in marine provinces, and we'll learn more about them in plate tectonics and marine geology. But for now, we'll just say the deepest place on the Earth is the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. About 36,200 feet. So we say, here's the surface of the ocean, and then it goes down 36,200 feet. 36,200. Okay, well let's superimpose Mount Everest on here. Mount Everest is around 29,035 feet. So, that's not as deep as the deepest part of the ocean. We could say roughly 36,000 minus 29,000 is 36 minus 29, seven. So if we take this and we say, here is an ocean depth of 7,000 feet, and we put Mount Everest into this trench right here from the bottom. Mount Everest would not even reach the surface of the ocean. So trying to put in perspective how big the oceans are, how vast, how enormous, how deep, how expansive and amazing our Earth's oceans are. Deeper than the tallest mountain, deeper than the Matterhorn, deeper than the Mile High City, deeper than the tallest building currently, the Burj Khalifa, 2,723 feet. The oceans have an average depth of about 12,500 feet, which is pretty deep, um, but that's unequally distributed. Shallower close to land, deeper in some of these uh, oceanic trenches, so on and so forth. So we can divide the world into five principal oceans, the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, and Southern or Antarctic. And each one is unique and has its own characteristics. And I'd like to go through them one by one. Let's do it. The Pacific Ocean encompasses 
the largest amount of area, in fact, about 50% of the world's oceans are or is the Pacific Ocean. It accounts for half of the ocean water. It's a big ocean. To the west of the Americas, to the east of Australia and Asia, it's the world's deepest ocean and the largest single geographic feature, the Pacific Ocean Basin. It was named in 1520 by Ferdinand Magellan as he circumnavigated the world, and it is known for its vastness, how big it is, and also for the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is not highlighted here, but it is a ring or a boundary, a tectonic boundary that has a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of volcanoes, a lot of earthquakes. Again, can't wait for plate tectonics and marine geology, but Pacific Ocean is known for the Pacific Ring of Fire. So from the largest ocean to Second largest will be the Atlantic Ocean that separates the Americas from Africa and Europe. Also the Old World from the New World from, uh, this is an important area of commerce and shipping. There's a lot of things moving across this ocean. It's not as big, it's easier to transport goods from and across here. Uh, it's about half the size of the Pacific. It is also not quite as deep as the Pacific Ocean, and that makes sense. It's neither as geographically expansive or volumetrically big, so it is also not near as deep, but very, very important, especially when it comes to the movement of heat across the globe. Oceans regulate climate in magical and a myriad of ways. It's not magic, it's science actually. But the Gulf Stream, which originates down here near the Gulf of Mexico, transports a lot of heat across the northern Atlantic Ocean, keeping the climates of northern Europe from freezing and very temperate. So thank you, Atlantic Ocean, for your Atlantic circulation patterns. Third biggest ocean in line is going to be the Indian Ocean, completely in the Southern Hemisphere. <clears throat> Located south of Asia, between Africa and Australia. Um, smaller than the Atlantic, but of similar depths. And wildly important for specific weather patterns known as monsoons, where you have by season, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me where you have, by season, a uh, reversal of the wind direction because of the effects of land and sea. And this has to do everything with the heat capacity of water and the, different, the differential heat capacities of land and sea. This global monsoon season has effects on marine fisheries, primary productivity, supporting marine ecosystems. The Arctic Ocean. Smallest and shallowest of the oceans located around the North Pole. It's mostly frozen most of the time, but seasonal differences. Sea ice melts in summer, sea ice uh, freezes in winter. There are portions that are covered by meters of thick sea ice continuously all year long. And the Arctic Ocean and Arctic sea ice is a warning sign. It's an indicator we can observe some of the effects of global climate change happening in real time by measuring the rates of sea ice retreat over the years and connecting that into global atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. So last but not least is the Southern Ocean. Wait, do I have small? Oh, okay. Can't have two smallest up there. The Southern Ocean. I'll have to go back and fact check that one. But the Southern Ocean circumnavigates the Antarctic region. And up until about 2000, this wasn't considered an ocean. It was considered just to be a collection of the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, all at the bottom. But around 2000, um, it was designated as its own individual ocean adopted by the United States, but not adopted by every state. So uh, it's an area of further discussion. But for our intents and purposes in the United States, 
we recognize the Southern Ocean as the world's fifth principal ocean, characterized by strong Antarctic circumpolar currents and located below 60 degrees latitude. So there are five oceans, the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, the Arctic, and the Southern Ocean, each of them unique, each of them providing different processes to our Earth. They all join together through this phenomenon called thermohaline circulation. The oceans are big, the oceans are deep, and the oceans are variable. They cover about 71% of our Earth and contain approximately 97% of Earth's total water. So with a feature, with a phenomenon that great, it affects every other system on Earth. So while we like to study chemistry and biology and even uh, non-science uh, disciplines like anthropology or psychology, which are, you know, is our science in a way of their own kinds, more liberal arts, but still applying objective reasoning to understanding how things are going. The oceans affect everything on Earth. They affect every single organism, and they affect, for humans, everything that we do. Even if we have never seen the oceans, we are intricately related to the effects that the oceans create. The boundaries between these oceans have evolved over time, giving us historical, cultural, geographical, and scientific variability that has shaped the way that we view them. And in turn, our deepening understanding of the oceans has helped us to understand many other avenues of our own lives and how processes on land also work. So in conclusion with all of this, the oceans are important. They are wildly important. They're important for you, and they're important for me, and they're important for everything that happens on Earth. With that, thank you so much, and I'll see you again.